the scripture reading will be taken from Mark 14, verses 53 and 54, and 66 through 72. That was Mark 14, 53, 54, and 66 through 72. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance, ran into the courtyard of the high priest, and sat with the servants and warmed himself at a fire. 66 says, Now as Peter was b below them in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked, up at, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you were saying. And he went down out on the porch, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, This is one of them, but he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by Peter by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man whom you speak. A second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. It's good to see you all out with us this morning. Um, if you'll open up your, your Bibles there, if you haven't already. Uh, the passage that we're talking about, and we're going to be kind of bouncing around between um, the Gospels um, for this, uh, for what was happening here in this moment where Peter uh, defected, where Peter had betrayed Christ, he had left Christ, he had abandoned him. And more importantly, though, what the goal of this lesson is, is not so much to talk about this, and we will, we'll discuss his defection, but later on in the lesson, I want to bring it around and show where Peter also received Jesus' grace, that Peter was also restored, um, that we can go through times in our life where seemingly we have abandoned Christ, we have become disheartened, we have left our first love, but that his grace is sufficient and that it's there to restore us as well. Talking about Peter, though, whenever we talk about Peter and we, we look at this, this passage, uh, we know that this is kind of the pinnacle. This is the, the highlight of, of where uh, Peter is, is that individual who just opens his mouth up to say something and puts both of his feet into his mouth, right? He doesn't just put one foot in his mouth. He puts both of his feet in his mouth. He, he is, he's very forward. And so when we think about Peter, we think about his forward nature. And in this moment... You know, Peter had, had boasted about all these things. He had boasted about how he was going to follow Christ, but he didn't. There's other passages that we can turn to, though, that show that, Jesus, or that, that Peter had done this very thing. So turning with me to Matthew uh, chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14, starting verse 28. <clears throat> it says, uh, I'm in the wrong chapter there. There we go. It says, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when Jesus, but when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And so Je uh, Peter, in this moment, it does exactly what he normally does. He cries out and says that, you know, I, I'm ready to come down there. I, I'm willing to do this. Just bid me come. Bid me to do this, and I will join you down there and, and perform this, this uh, act of faith in order to do this. Nobody else had done that, you know, but Peter is showing his forward nature in this moment by doing that. And when he does, he goes out and he fails, as oftentimes we do as well. We go out and we try something and we fail. Turn over a page or two. Chapter 16. In verse 16, and it says, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He had that confession of Jesus Christ. He was the one that said, when Jesus is asking, Who do you guys say that I am? Do you say that 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of these others? Do you say that I am, uh, you know, John the Baptist or Elijah uh, or Jeremiah, one of the other prophets? No, you are Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. He shows his forward nature in this moment by, by, by saying this, by saying that, you know, acknowledging Christ's deity, right? He's showing his forward nature in this moment. And he also shows his forward nature over in chapter 17, in verse 4. He says, and Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He puts his foot in his mouth there too, doesn't he? Because while he was still speaking, behold, a bright light, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased to hear him. He's showing his, his physical uh, understanding in this moment. He's still focusing more or less in, in this moment on the physical things of this life. And turning back um, to, ta to chapter 16, in verse 22, where he rebukes Christ, where he, he kind of turns him aside and, and we might assume that he is trying to, to say this in a way that's not necessarily like trying to uh, create a stumbling block for Christ. He, I don't think that's what his intent is. I don't think that's necessarily what we're getting out of this passage here. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. And what is this that he's talking about? Christ's crucifixion, Christ's death, that he's going to suffer many things and that he's going to die Jesus Christ had said that he was going to do those things. Peter's looking at it this way. He's like, I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want you to suffer. I don't want any harm to come to you. Far be it from you, Lord. Don't let, we, we don't want these things to happen. But we know that that was a temptation for Jesus because Jesus also didn't want to necessarily go onto the cross. He didn't want to endure that pain. But his love outweighed his, his human nature in that, didn't it? But we see that Peter does this time and time again. These are just a few moments of those, the ones that we usually hit on. But turning back to the conversation about his defection here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26, verses 33 through 35. <clears throat> Peter said to him this, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. So said all the other disciples. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go. Oh, I started the wrong passage. Didn't I? I did. <laughs> I jumped right down to the, the punchline. Let me jump back up to verse 33. It says, Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. So here we see that Peter is, is boasting about what he would do. That doesn't matter about all these other people here. All these other people might, might be made to stumble. All these other people might fail you, but not me. I'll not fail you. I'll not stumble. I'll not... I, if it comes to it, I'll die right alongside with you. I will be right there with you, Christ. That's his boast. And oftentimes we do the same thing. Oftentimes we are quick to boast of ourselves. We are too ready to criticize others, to lift ourselves up onto a pedestal, to make ourselves look better in our own strength, in our own merit. Is that the way that we should do this? Is that the way that we should go about this? We see that Peter does this. And what is Jesus' response to him? <laughs> Jesus' response to him is a very humbling statement right there. Peter, before this night is even over, you're going to de deny me three times. Not just once. Three times you're going to deny me. You know, we, we often do that. You know, we, we think, you know, maybe, what is this other person doing? What are they even doing? What, what, what about uh, if that were me in their situation, I'd do this, or I'd have done it this way. 
You know, one of the things that I remember from Walmart is that sometimes, you know, you get those new people in and they don't necessarily know what they're doing, right? And they're, they're stalking and they're taking too long on something and we had times that we had to stick to. We had time frames that were very crucial in our, our, our business to make sure that we were hitting those goals and could I just have stood back? It was my job not to just have stood back and watched them fail, but I had to go up and explain to them, hey, this is a better way of doing something. That's what we should all do. When we see somebody failing, when we see that somebody's um, uh, in this moment where they're struggling, we need to help out. We talked about that this morning in, in the Bible study that, you know, I was only in public school for two grades. I was only in kindergarten and first grade. The rest of it, I was homeschooled, all right? Now, I do remember, though, that I was held back from recess, and I didn't tell the kids that part. And I wasn't allowed to go to recess because I, was, I didn't do my, 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 uh, my work. I didn't do my, my math problems. I had trouble with math. And there was a, another student there that decided she was going to stick around inside, and she was also going to forgo recess and help me out with my math so that way I could go out and enjoy that. And I told the kids, I was like, you know, we're talking about doing good deeds. You can do good deeds like that too. Get with your teacher and ask to do something like that. If you're strong in a subject, help your fellow students out. Do something good for those other, for your fellow students. We should be looking to do those kinds of things, right? I'm 35 years old. And at the time, I would have been six or seven years old whenever this is all going on, right? It's like that's still, that's a memory that I still have of that time frame when I was in school. If that still is, is with me now, what do you guys, you know, what do you guys think if you were to help out one of your fellow students? Do you think they'd re remember it or do you think they'd forget it? Well, I'm here to tell you they would remember. We need to help those other individuals out. Peter, or not Peter, Paul uh, warns us of this type of thinking in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you'll turn with me there and look at verse 12. It says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And then also turning to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 3. It says, I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in, Jesus, in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry, let, it, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches and teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let's take heed and reflect on these things and how we ought to behave as Christians, how we ought to think about ourselves in these situations, not to boast of ourselves, not to think everyone else might do something and fail, but I won't. I'll never stumble. Instead, we need to think about it in our own weakness. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10. This is something that uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and start at verse 7 in this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7, it says, And lest I should be exalted above measure... By the abundance of the revelations, a measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart. Weakness. That's Jesus saying that. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities than the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So when we endure hardships for doing things that Christ would have us to do, we endure hardships because we have purposefully made it to where we are, are doing Christ's work at, at the cost of 
physical things, at the cost of the, the, our, our livelihood here in this life, at the cost of having that next good toy, at the next big thing, at the next self-centered focus thing, whatever it may be. We need to take the focus off of ourself and our boastings and our pride and turn to our weaknesses because the strength is from Christ. The strength is from God. It's not in ourselves. It's not in us. It's in Christ that we find our strength. Turn with me to John chapter 18. John chapter 18 and verse 10. Because Peter drew his sword in this action. and He, he drew his sword and he attacked uh, Malchus and struck his ear off. Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And here we see that Peter, you know, this, this is uh, something that had happened prior to this too, that Christ had even said prior to going to the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, remember whenever I'd sent you guys out? Remember when I'd sent you out and I said, don't, don't worry about taking this and that and the other because it's going to be provided for you. You will be provided for. I didn't tell you to take a sword with you. He said, but now he's saying, go ahead and sell. If you have a, a, a tunic, sell your tunic and buy a sword with it. And they said, well, hey, we already have two swords. And he said, it's enough. So Jesus had said that. And here Peter is now that they're in this predicament as they're being attacked, as Christ is, is about to go and endure all the things he's going to endure to be crucified, he strikes this servant and cuts off his right ear. Verse 11, Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Kind of mixed signals there a little bit, right? That Peter's probably taking the secret. He's, he's not necessarily understanding what's going on. When we see that passage, you know, we could dive into that passage and look at that and say, well, why did Jesus even mention buying a sword if he didn't want them to use it? And Peter might have had this, this idea that, um, that this was still going to be a, a physical kingdom because that's what they, their, their line of thinking was from the Pharisees, from the teachings all this time was that it was going to be physically in this life, that, that Jesus was going to be a king like David, somebody who had conquered and, and had great accomplishments and had done many good things and established God's kingdom on this earth in that sense, right? And they thought that maybe Jesus was going to do that same thing. So he might be still thinking along those lines, still thinking very physically instead of spiritually. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 26. And read the account that's given to us there. Matthew 26, starting in verse 51. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And we know that to be Peter. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. All who live by the sword shall die by the sword. Do you not think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? More than 12 legions of angels. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to all the multitudes, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples forsook him and fled. So here we see that Jesus expounds upon this in, in the account from Matthew. Scolds Peter about drawing his sword. And we also know that, that he took that year and he healed Malchus as well. He, he, he mended that. He made it right. But he's saying this, my kingdom, when he says this, he, I, I could end this now. I don't need your sword physically. I don't need that. Instead, I could have an immortal army of 12 legions of angels come down and just eradicate everything. We could be done right here and now. But he loves us so much. 
he loves you to go through what he was going to endure. That way his kingdom can be brought spiritually. That way sins can be forgiven. We could have a, a, a hope of a home in heaven with him. It's not physically. It's not here in this life. If we live in this life, we'll die here. And that, that will be our death. We, if we live by the sword, we'll die by the sword. Well, we could also look at that physically and say that if we only focus on the world, guess what? That's all we'll ever obtain. That's all we'll ever have is the things in this life. And then once those things have passed away, guess what? We'll have nothing but pain and anguish for eternity because we gave up the best gift ever that Christ paid with his life on the cross to give us. We'll be missing the point. And so we see that Peter, having been chastised by Christ in this moment, we see that he and all of the disciples forsook him. They all fled. They all left him. You know, sometimes we're that same way, right? We get disappointed. We get um, send something to us about something. We get disappointed. Jesus, or Peter in this moment, he, he's disappointed in himself. He, he doesn't understand his master. He's, he, he's done this time and time again as we looked at prior and all those other accounts where he had stuck his foot in his mouth. He had he'd made some claim or he had tried something and he failed and he failed and maybe he was thinking to himself, how many times am I going to mess up? Do we not have this same thought in our minds whenever we mess up, whenever we fail, whenever we fall short? We have those same thoughts kind of running through our minds. His courage was beginning to fail him. But even so, he began to follow from a distance. Verse 58, Matthew 26. It says, but Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went and sat with the servants to see the end. So he sat there, and, and he's, he's following from a distance. And let's turn to Luke chapter tw uh, 22. <clears throat> Luke chapter 22, I want us to take note of something very specific here, very, uh, something very interesting. Starting in verse 31, it says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Satan is actively looking for him. Now, what's interesting is that we could go to Job and we could... Um, we could look at the distinction, the difference between Job's account where Satan goes and asks for Job. He asks. In this passage here, Satan has asked for you, but when you turn and look at the original text, it's more of a demand than a, a hey, can I tempt this person? And if you look at the original text, it's more of a demand. It's more of a, no, I, I demand Peter. I demand these ones. His attitude is completely different in this. And Christ has paid, prayed that his fail, faith does not fail him. That's a very, very specific thing that we need to take into consideration when it comes to this individual Peter. That Satan is demanding his soul. He is demanding him. And we know that it's easier to withstand the devil when we're amongst brethren. But... When we begin to distance ourselves from our brothers, when we begin to distance ourselves from Christ, we are more open to attacks. And there are many today that are following from a distance, that are not including themselves in, in the fold, that are, are staying out of things, that are staying away from Christ. And when we're away like we are, in that manner, we are vulnerable. We're open to attack. And this is part of the reason why Peter had failed. It's because he excluded himself. He followed from a distance. And because of that, we see that he denies Christ three times. Starting in verse 54. Says, having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. And when they had uh, 
kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together and noticed that point as well, that they had kindled a fire. That's going to come up later. Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him and sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You are, with, you are one of them. Peter said, Man, I am not. And about an hour, uh, an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord looked, turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so Peter went out and wept bitterly. He was beside himself. He had boasted that I'll never forsake you. I'll be right there with you. And he did not come through on that promise. He failed him. And he wept bitterly about that. Do we do this? Do we put ourselves in situations where we are setting ourselves up to fail? And then when we do fail, that do, do we... Do we feel that? Do we feel that failure? Or do we brush it off and say, meh, not a big deal? Because I, I think that we put ourselves in these situations more often than we, th than we realize. But we need to be like Peter was and how whenever he had realized his mistakes, that we weep about it, that we are sorry about it, and that that sorrow produces repentance And now we turn to one of our final passages in John. John chapter 21. Everything has happened. Everything is all said and done. Christ has endured the cross. He has died. He's resurrected. He appears before many. He appears before the apostles. And here is another appearance of Jesus Christ before his disciples in this chapter, in this final chapter of John. Let's read this account starting at verse 15. It says, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, oh, let me make a point to mention that when they had come ashore, that Peter, whenever he had arrived, Jesus was near a fire pit in this instance. Verse 9, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and, a fish, and, and uh, fish laid on it and bread. Now let's go to verse 15. It says, And when they had uh, eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he had said to him, follow me. So in this passage here, as we read through this, we need to take special note of that, the setting of the stage, right? We looked at these passages earlier and how there was, Peter was around uh, this, this fire pit. Peter was around these coals. He was around that fire there in the courtyard. The stage has been reset for Peter in this moment. When they come ashore, Jesus is around the fire pit. Jesus is right there, and they go through this sequence of being questioned. Do you agape me, Peter? Lord, you know that I phileo you. And there's a difference between those two words, and uh, I don't know if we've uh, hit on those things or not, but agape love is that selfless love, that love that is, is one that is... Uh, characterized by, you don't have to do anything for me. I will always pour into you, though. There is no restriction to this love. There's no, uh, it is a very selfless love. 
And that's what Jesus is asking here. Phileo is more of that brotherly love that is in the close friendships. Now, there are some, though, that argue that those words are, are pretty close, pretty interchangeable. There are slight differences to those ones. But there is a, there's a difference. There's a distinction, a distinction made by John who is particular about details to include that in the scripture. So we ought to pay special notice to that. We also need to pay attention that he's not calling him Peter. I, I kind of skipped over that point there. He's not calling him Peter. He's not calling him that, that name that he had given him. He said on this rock, that rock of faith, that, 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 that rock of uh, Christ, uh, Peter saying that you are Christ, the Son of the living God, that uh, confession of his faith. He's calling him by his former name. but he's setting this stage up and he asks him these three times, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? And in that third time, Jesus actually changes and switches over to phileo. Do you phileo me? And so we see that question being asked over and over. What about me? Do, do I love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you agape love him? Do you phileo love him? Now in this third time, as all this is going on, we have to know that Peter is thinking, this is exactly like it was when I had denied you three times. And here he has affirmed him three times. Right? But we need to look at the distinction also. This is a very interesting point. We need to look at the distinction between the words that are being used for no as well. In this passage, in verse 17, he said to him, Lord, you know all things. That means uh, the, the word that's used there is uh, Edo. It means to see or to perceive uh, with the senses to know these things. Jesus Christ, as God, knows all things, does he not? Yes, he does. He knows all these things. He is aware of all things. Jesus Christ knows of his love. But Peter also makes it a point to say, Inesco. You know all things, and you, Ganesco, you know that by example, by experience, is what Ganesco is. That you have perceived these things by experience, by it being lived out. You know that I love you, because I have done actions to show that I love you. And you have experienced those actions, that I love you. John makes it a very big point to, to, to use that language, to make sure that that has been expressed in this manner. I think that we should definitely take note of it. What about us? Do we agape love Christ? Do we phileo love Christ? We need to love him without reservation. And we need to love him like a brother because he is our brother. When we have been baptized we become a, a brother in Christ, a joint heir with Christ, and we will also inherit that home in heaven with him. Just one, a couple more passages that I want to turn to. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21 through 23 says this. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Do you know which version of the word no is being used in there? Ganesco. The one by example, the one that you, you know because of the things that I've done, the things that you've experienced that I love you, that you have actually experienced those things. Is that going to be us? Does Christ know our love because of his experience with our love, of our demonstrating love? And our final passage, 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. Verse 
1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, because there are times in our lives where we're going to fail. We're going to find ourselves like Peter was and how he had failed, how he had made all kinds of things, uh, said all kinds of things and, and done all kinds of things that showed that he was trying, but he ultimately failed. We ourselves are like that, are we not? We try all kinds of things and we fail. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you feel that your, your, your life as a Christian has not been up to par. That you're following at a distance. Now it's come to this point where we can offer this invitation to you to come closer to Christ, to join him. If, if you are, uh, have not been baptized, if you have not obeyed, now is your opportunity to come closer, to join Christ. As Peter said that he was going to die with Christ, he ultimately did. He ultimately did. The language that's used there was used in a, in a fashion that's very similar to being outstretched on a cross. And we know from uh, Eusebius' uh, writings that it was told that Peter had died on the cross upside down. He did die with Christ. You can die with Christ today by forfeiting your life in subjection to him, by forfeiting your physical life in subjection to him to live a life anew spiritually for him. And we see in this passage here that if we do falter, if we do fail, in verse 9 it says he, or, um, wrong chapter, I've done that too many times. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're all sinners. We've all failed. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Do you need that cleansing power today? If you do, please come forward, take a seat on the front as we stand and sing.